Jeremy Stern. He graduated wow. PGT about three million years ago. <laughs> I'll let him tell you his life story. Um, yeah. But Jeremy started at PGT when he was like nine or eight nine years old. Years old. Yeah, yeah. Um, and did a million years until he graduated from high school. And I'll let you tell him I about- actually, This is still on my desk at home, which if you graduate, you get one of these, which Aww. is pretty cool. So I still, I put it here for inspiration. Oh, all right. Well, I'll let you take it away then. Okay. So it's so nice to meet you guys. Full disclosure, I've never done this before. So if it's confusing, just like, or you have questions, just say like, I have a question or I am confused because I can't see you raise your hand. <laughs> um, and I won't be mad if you interrupt. I really have no ego. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, um, hey guys. So my name is Jeremy and I am former PGT student of eight or eight years, I wanna say maybe nine if we do the math. Uh, nine wild years, multiple locations. So we've been in so many places, Joe and Steven, that this just feels like every summer we hopped around anyway. So it's what, you know. that's what I said when we had to go virtual. I was like, this is just going back to our roots. Before it's Larchmont Temple all over again. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's so nice to meet all you guys and I hope you're having a good summer. So after graduating PGT, I went to college and I stayed in, on the East Coast. Um, but I recently moved to LA and I had started my, you know, adult big boy career doing movies, but I recently pivoted to becoming a television producer. And I'm here to tell you that if you all want to grow up and be a TV producer, you can do it because it's not that hard. I know because I do it. <laughs> so we're going to break it down super simplistically. How many, uh, if you watch TV, say yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what what TV shows are uh, you guys watching right now? Grey's Anatomy. Cool. Grey's Academy. N nice. Mouse Academy is my favorite show. Which one? Mouse Academy. Yeah. Greenhouse Academy. Someone's there watching Greenhouse Academy right now. Greenhouse Academy. Cool. Um, those are all great shows. Um, well, part of my job is so I'm a television producer, and I actually I work for Disney. And I have a deal, and my job is I produce television shows for Disney. Um, I don't make things like Moana or Frozen. I'm not in the movie game. And I would love that Moana money, so don't get me wrong. But I do the TV side. And you may not realize how many shows are Disney TV shows. There are so many that you may not even be aware of. So I live in L.A. I work on the Disney lot. And I'm surrounded by office buildings and Mickey Mouse statues. It's like a weird combination of Disney apparel and just offices, but it's a lot of fun. So we're just gonna hop in. I have a question. Who knows what all these TV shows have in common? Just holler out if you have a guess. There are no bad ideas. They don't look like they have a lot in common. They don't have a lot in common. <laughs> they don't look like they have a lot in common. <laughs> yes. uh, they yes. are... What? So the thing that they have in common is that they don't look like they have, they all don't look like they have a lot in common. <laughs> that's, a, that's like the, you getting um, a genie and having three wishes and asking for a thousand more wishes. No, but that is a good hustle. Disney? They are all Disney TV shows. Well done. Good job, Hannah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the movies you may be aware, like Frozen and Star Wars and Moana are all Disney movies, but the Disney TV shows, you may not realize how many of them are TV, and they range from animated shows like The Simpsons to family sitcoms like Modern Family to more cable shows like The Americans and Little Fires Everywhere. Let me minimize this a bit. Great. Um, so going in cold, what do you guys think a producer does? Because they're a, it's a big term and it means a lot. Let's see, Raga's got a hand up. Raga, what do you think? Well, they kind of produce movies. Yeah. They but if make you were, movies. But Raga, if you were to break it down, what do you think producing a movie means? Like, how would you, in your mind, describe it? Like almost like a director, but not exactly at the same time. Yeah, a little bit. That's a great way of thinking about it. So if you break down the term, like you go in the dictionary, you look up to produce, the first thing you'll see is to make or manufacture from components or raw materials. Okay, that seems very scientific and I'm really bad at science. 
what producing means is we make it happen. We turn an idea, something in your head, into something physical. So in a way, you could think of Stephen and Jill as producing camp. They have this idea of it and they, kind of, they put the pieces in place to make it happen. Because without a producer, you can't see what you're looking at. It's all in your head. Um, does that make sense, guys? Say yes or no. Because I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're yeah. going to say yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yes, it makes sense. Yeah, so we make it happen. Producers make it happen. When you do a PGT show, you have a director, you have a musical director, but then Jill and Steven produce it in that they make sure the sets are running, they make sure the director has a rehearsal schedule, they make sure you come to the theater and come to PGT. That's what we do. So if you wanna produce a TV show, there are three things every producer needs to find to do it successfully. Material, talent, and money. Who can guess what, who, think, who thinks they know what material is? Just shout it out because I really can't see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the script. The script, good idea. So material could be a script or just an idea. You could pitch a show, as I think Maddie taught you guys about earlier. It can be a completely original idea. Who here has seen Modern Family? Say yes or no. Yeah. 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 I saw hands go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, mo so Modern Family was just an original idea that the writers had. It wasn't. It was a base based on anything. So they pitched the show and then they wrote the script and that's the material. But it can. There are all different places that material can come from, and part of a producer's job is finding that material. So whether it's meeting with the writer and exploring whatever idea that writer has, or we can look for books, we can look for articles, we can look for podcasts, we can do a spinoff show. Like I don't know if you guys watch Riverdale, but the Sabrina show on Netflix was a spinoff of Riverdale. So that's the material you take one show and kind of take a character out of it and place them elsewhere. Does that make sense? Say mm -hmm. yes or no. <laughs> yes. Great. Yes. Yes. So, so you can be producers because if you're reading books and you're listening to podcasts and reading the newspaper and you see a story that you love and you think that could be a great TV show, you're already one third on your way to producing. Mm -hmm. So then we need talent. I, as a producer, don't consider myself talent necessarily. I would say a talent, just to make it very basic, is a writer, a director, or an actor. A writer is the person who puts pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and just writes the story. A director executes the writer's vision by putting it on a screen. And then the actor, as you guys often are, brings those words to life with the help of the director. So do you guys know any writers whom you love? Who are your favorite writers? J.K. Rowling. Love J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. That's a great I that's a great one. Do you guys know any directors or actors whom you love? Kenny Ortega. Um, Kenny Cameron. Ortega. Great answer. Duff Cameron. I'm sorry? Duff Cameron. I don't is he an actor? It's a it's a she. She's an it's actor. She's an actor. Yeah, great. Actor. Cool. He's the Disney Channel actor. Yeah. Ah, cool. She's great. What show is she on? She's Maddie. Maddie. She was also she was also in the Hairspray Live. Cool. Movie. She was awesome. she's currently in Mean Girls, I believe. Ooh. And she's on Cloud Nine too. You guys are so knowledgeable. Are you coming after my jobs? By the way, Jerry, Maddie didn't know any of the shows they're watching either. <laughs> <laughs> She texted me saying they've never seen Gilmore Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Dove Cameron it's a, it's a was a seminal classic. What were you saying? Dove Cameron was in Descendants. That was directed by. Oh yes, I know of Descendants. Very very wonderful um, movie and multiple movies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that example, you know, the first idea of the Descendants, it's a, it's a, it's the villains of Disney, right? That's the idea. So that is material in that you're taking all these different Disney stories and looking at those characters and bringing their children, their descendants together. That's material. And then once you look, once you do the sequels, you're bouncing off the material from the original movie. Mm -hmm. So that's all producing is, is looking for stories and finding great talent who can bring it to life. Sounds easy, right? Well, we need money. And you think that finding money would be easy because there's, they, they print more money every day in the bank, but actually <laughs> it's the hardest part of the job because making TV shows 
is expensive. It, throw out a number. How much do you think it costs to make an episode of television? Just throw out a guess. Um, maybe like a million dollars. Okay, any other yeah, guesses? Yeah, a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe a million dollars. A thousand dollars? Maybe like ten dollars? Ten <laughs> thousand. Definitely not ten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely not a hundred thousand. You can make an episode of TV for a million. That will be the cheapest episode of TV you can make. There are some shows that do shows on the cheap, but you're looking anywhere between four to twenty million dollars an episode. That's insane. It's insane. But and then if you're doing multi, if you're doing twenty-two episodes a season and you run for, for you know ten years, it's a lot of money. So it's my job to convince the people with the money to give us the money. And that dictates basically every single decision a producer makes because we can love a story, we can love a director, but if we think we cannot sell the show to people with the money, then there's no point in taking on the project as much as we love it. And by the way, producers take on projects all the time that they think they can sell and that they're unable to. I have in my career sold movies and TV shows and I have had movies and TV shows that I've worked on that have not sold. And that's just kind of the game. You're throwing silly putty against the wall and seeing what sticks, hopefully with a bit of strategy. Uh, but it's really expensive to make this stuff. <laughs> and you gotta really make a very convincing argument to, P to the networks and the people with the money that this is a show that we have to have on the air and it's a show that's also immensely entertaining and that people want to see. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Say yes or no. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. 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 And it's crazy. It's crazy. It's also very competitive because everybody wants to work in showbiz. So you gotta like really, but if I can do it, you guys can do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so you're thinking, Jeremy, we get it. We need money. I want the money. And believe me, I want the money too. But this is how we can talk about getting it. So networks have the money. They are the buyer. A studio like Disney and myself, the producer, we are the seller. So sellers sell products that we produce to buyers. So to, in, in my job, I work with Disney on everything we do. And if there's a project that I love and a project that Disney loves as a TV show, we will partner together and try and sell it as um, a TV show to various networks. Okay, what are some networks that you guys watch or know about? Can you just throw some out? ABC. ABC, yes. Keep it coming. True TV. True TV, deep cut. Nice. Optimum. <laughs> Sorry? Optimum. Optimum, so Optimum is a cable provider. That's how you get your cable, but it's not a network. So you don't sell to Optimum. So that's a really good guess. Yeah. How about the CW? Nickelodeon? The CW. Great. What else? Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. Freeform. PBS. Freeform. I have a PBS project there. Netflix. PBS. Yes. Netflix, the biggest of them all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. Or um, yeah. Ha have you heard of Hulu? Hulu. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Plus. Disney Plus, a brand new one. Have you guys yeah. heard of um, Peacock, which launched last week? It's a new streamer. Yeah, of it. I'm like YouTube, I saw ads. Yeah, so Peacock launched last week as another streamer that you can subscribe to. How about YouTube TV? I think that's a thing. So that's a great question. YouTube went actually went out of business as something that makes original TV shows. Uh -huh. So you can still upload your own videos like on TikTok to YouTube and you can watch plenty of videos and you know shows will put their trailers on or if you want to watch news clips those will still go on YouTube but YouTube is no longer buying new TV series that they're going to like spend millions of dollars in. I think that there's something called YouTube TV. Yeah. So YouTube TV is actually another version of Optimum. It's how you can connect to other networks, but they're not buying shows. Yeah, but that's uh -huh. a great idea. Um, have you guys heard of HBO? It's a little old for you. I've heard of it. Do your parents My watch dad it? Yeah. yeah. That's so crazy that it's old. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's very adult. Or um, do you guys, is anyone here a fan of the show Friends? I've heard of it. I've you've heard, heard of, it. of it? Oh, you're making me feel old. <laughs> I um, love Friends. You love Friends. You know where it's streaming right now? It's a new streaming platform. 
What? HBO Max. HBO is, Max. Yes. Oh, I, I saw that on an ad on YouTube. Yeah, so we're going to talk about all those networks because in order for you guys to be a successful producer, you have to know whom you're selling to. You can't just like run out on the street and say like, flowers, flowers for sale. You have to make a targeted list and think about who's going to buy your TV show. So we're going to break it down into three categories. So we first have broadcast networks. Someone brought up um, the CW. Can you guys see my mouse, by the way? Yes. Okay, so you, someone mentioned the CW, which is great. Um, who knows what this logo stands for? Shout I it out. NBC. NBC, yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay, and then who knows what this logo stands for? Oh, my God. Channel 7? CBS. It might be Channel it. 7 on your cable. CBS yeah. is what it's called. Exactly. And then we have Fox and ABC. So these are what are called the broadcast networks, and they're actually amongst the oldest networks in all of TV. They've CBS and uh, NBC, I think, have been around since like the 60s, and it, they're, they're, they're storied networks. And yeah, when I was a little girl, that's the only TV we had. <laughs> exactly. So look that's how it comes. <laughs> that's how you watch TV. Yeah. And you watched it when it was on. And if, I remember, Jill, you had a VCR until like 2010, right? Oh, yeah. I, we had a VCR. But have, yeah. It may still, <laughs> it's, knowing Stephen A. Bush, it's probably still in the attic. <laughs> uh, it's still in our office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So you guys, um, you guys probably watch a lot of shows on broadcast networks. Um, when you think about broadcast networks, they're usually lower on your cable. So it's two or four or five. Um, and they're known for a few different things. So they're known for family-friendly content. So usually things that you guys can all watch with your parents and they won't get mad if you watch when they're out to work. Um, and that's what we call co-viewing, which means diff multiple generations can watch together. So. Someone here said they watch Grey's Anatomy, right? Yep, that was me. Yeah, that's a great co-viewing show to watch with your mom as a teenager. And that's what it's marketed as. So broadcast networks have the biggest audiences and need the most people to watch. And they need the most people to watch all the time because that's how they make their money. So oftentimes the shows have 22 episodes a season. Grey's Anatomy, I think, does 22 hour long episodes a year, which means they probably are shooting nine to ten months of the year just to make because it takes that long um, the broadcast networks don't do anything called a limited series which means something that goes for eight episodes and then just is kaput and does no more because they need you to keep coming back every year and oftentimes they don't spend a lot on their shows on the broadcast networks some of their shows are a bit expensive Grey's Anatomy having been on for 17 years is a bit more expensive at this point but most of their shows are actually pretty um, cheap. They're often shot on a sound stage, and the, the, the cast often isn't that famous, so they're often less expensive. Um, who knows some broadcast shows? What can you guess besides Grey's Anatomy? Riverdale is on the CW, right? Riverdale is a broadcast show, not an expensive show to make. I watch it on Netflix, though. Isn't that interesting, though? That you, the young people are watching Netflix. Um, <laughs> okay, and what, what are some other broadcast shows? Full House. Full House was on Netflix. It Any was other originally ideas? on Netflix, Full House? Oh, no, that's a good point, Jill. It was originally on um, a defunct network called the WB, but now it, Fuller House is on Netflix. Oh, Full House was on ABC originally. Was on ABC? Oh, yeah, there it was you go. On, yeah, it was on a, uh, they had a Friday night grouping of shows, like Step by Step and, oh, is and that true? Full House oh. and all that stuff. Thank That's you. for us old folks in the room. <laughs> um, great. Well, also, I don't know if you guys watch Modern Family or Blackish or Fresh Off the Boat or The Good Place. Those are all broadcast shows as well. Um, any questions? Yeah. I've, um, yeah. I'm sorry. I was wondering, what's an executive producer? Oh, what that's a think? great question. Executive producer in TV is the highest level of producer which is confusing because in movie producer is the highest level, but in TV, when someone is called an executive producer, it means they're like the president of Modern Family. <laughs> right, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, 
Now we're on to what's called a premium cable network, which I don't, you guys probably don't know many of these networks. They're geared exclusively at adults. They often do short seasons, eight to 10 episodes that are an hour, half hour long. They'll do limited series, like things that are one season, eight episodes, and they put it to, on a shelf and leave it. And they often take a lot of risks and, and push the boundaries. So places like HBO and Showtime are known for doing really edgy programming. So think about like some of the cool edgier shows PGT has done, like Hair or um, Pippin, the like The Wolves. The Wolves would have been, and it actually was in development at HBO as a TV show. <laughs> yeah, it's going straight to HBO. Yeah. So that that's what a premium cable network is. Have you guys heard of Comedy Central or Stars or AMC? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have yeah. stars. I've you heard start? of all of them. Nice. Showtime. You don't have Showtime? It's okay. It's not the best network. But I will say the budget shows, the budget of shows are arranged. So HBO is known for spending a lot of money. Comedy Central is actually known for being super cheap. Um, and if any of you guys, have you heard of South Park? Mm -hmm. That's a Comedy Central show that's very cheap to make. So, but the idea is that this is, these are really for, you know, 18 year olds or, or teenagers to watch with their parents. And then we have streamers. So we talked about Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, as we said, HBO Max and Peacock launched recently. And then there's also Apple TV. Does anyone have Apple TV? Mm -hmm. They're pretty new yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 We ha I have it. Cool. And then there's Disney Plus, which um, I know you all watched Hamilton on, which is awesome. Disney Plus is I really cool. It. And then, so the idea of streamers are they're kind of a hybrid between broadcast networks and premium cable so they do a lot of stuff that's super for adults like there's some shows on netflix i don't think you guys should be watching but there's plenty on netflix like fuller house that is great for you to watch or maybe something that's a little bit older like sabrina that you can watch with your parents except for disney plus which will only do children's and teenage content um they typically on the streamers do short seasons, eight to 10 episodes as well, and they will do a limited series. And what's important to note is the streamers will pay the most for their shows. The budgets are always the highest. Do you guys, anyone here watch Stranger Things? Yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so that's Stranger so Things. so good, right? So that show is so on Netflix, good. and every year the budget of that show increases. I think each episode was 22 million last season. Oh my wow. God. It's, but you look at it and it like, they built them all if you guys watch season three. Like they literally <laughs> built them all. That's how much the show costs. But the streamers, because they have the most money, will, and they're, they're transmitted through the internet, will spend the most. So if you are a good producer and you're selling a show and a lot of people want it, and there's what we call a bidding war, which is every producer's dream, oftentimes one of these places will get it because they'll pay the most for it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. So now we're going to do a case study about how, some, how you can produce the show and actually have a bidding war. Has anyone heard of this book? It's a beautiful book. If you're 16 or older, I highly recommend reading it because it's not that hard to read and it's just a wonderful story. It's, she's Celeste is one of my favorite authors and it's, it takes place in the 90s in Ohio and it is about a rich woman and a woman who cleans that person's house and how they fight with each other and how their children interact. And it's a beautiful, humane story about how to be kind to one another. So Celeste is an author who's written before. This book immediately went to the New York Times bestseller list when it came out. It just had the right press, the reviews were fantastic. And as you can see, they, they were very quick to put New York Times bestseller on the cover because that's how you sell books. So a lot of producers' jobs are, again, looking for what we call material. And so a bunch of really important people read this book immediately, and they were like, we see a TV show here. There's something so incredible. We have to make it. And this is, again, an author's dream because it gets competitive. So there's a person, a producer slash actress, who is very good at getting books and turning them into movies and TV shows. And her name is Reese Witherspoon. Have you guys heard of her? Yeah? Have you seen exactly. Legally Blonde? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Reese Witherspoon is a producer as well as an actress and a very successful one. And she is the best at getting hot books before anyone else does. So she got the rights to Little Fires Everywhere and said to the author, Celeste Ng, I will make your 
book into a TV show. Give me the chance to do it. Give me the rights and I will, I will do the best job. And Celeste said yes, because it's Reese Witherspoon. And then there was a great role, the, the co-starring role for Reese's friend, Kerry Washington. Have you guys ever heard of Kerry Washington? Please say yes. <laughs> yes. Anyone ever seen Scandal? Yes. Cool. So they, Reese said, I have the rights to this book, Kerry. You, we should, we've always wanted to work together. You would be perfect for my co-star. I want to do this with me. And Kerry read it and said, oh my God, please. And so then we had talent. And that is how you start producing. So Reese and Kerry are both actresses, but also both producers. And Kerry has the deal at Disney. ABC Studios is Disney. So if you, as a producer. So if you think about it, Kerry Washi and I have the same boss, which is kind of cool, even though we are very different. <laughs> so we have the same deal, Kerry and I, to produce for Disney. So because Kerry's exclusive as a producer to Disney, Disney became a studio on Little Fires Everywhere. And then Reese and Carrie said, okay, we have a book, we have, we're stars, we're going to do this show, and we have Disney, but let's make it even more exciting for buyers. So they brought on my friend, Liz Tigelar, who's an incredible writer and has written on so many shows dating back to Dawson's Creek back in the day. Um, and she came on to be the TV writer for the show. And everyone loves Liz and everyone wants to work with Liz. So then you, now you have the book, you have talent, all these incredible women, and then you have Disney as a studio. Holy moly, that's good producing. And we call that the package. And that is what, as sellers, we take out to buyers. Any questions so far? Cool. So they basically, once we had all these elements in place, we said, we're going to sell this baby. And they did. They had multiple authors on the show. Everyone wanted to make the show. And Ultimately, it went to Hulu. So Hulu bought the show. And Hulu did, did the best offer possible, which is they gave a what's called straight to series order at Hulu. What that means is Hulu said, we want this so badly that when you two women are available to work, we will go into production. We will make the show whenever you are ready. It is a commitment to making the show. And that is the best offer you can get because you can sell things and to, to networks and to buyers, but they may not ever make it, which kind of sucks, but that's the business. They are saying, we are committed to making it and paying you, you ladies very well, as they deserve. So now, a year and a half later, we have the money and the show is on Hulu. And if you're 16 and over, I recommend watching this with your parents on Hulu because it's a wonderful it's show. It's fantastic. And, the, and the, the show is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a very you know, simple case study in how you produce a show. You need money, you need talent, and you need material. And this is what they did, and they did it so successfully that they got a show on the air. Because it's even when you sell things, it is so competitive to get a show made and on the air. You go on to Netflix and there's, you're almost overwhelmed. It's like you're in Walmart and every shelf there's a different show, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is the best kind of offer that you can get as a producer. So as you brainstorm your own pilots, you always need to think about the three things, talent, material, and money. So we're going to do some quick questions, but do you guys have any you know, immediate questions about Little Fires Everywhere? Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. So in this pitch, you're a producer, you're living in LA like me, and you're developing the show. And here's the plot. When his wife, Andy, returns to work, Old school father, Adam Burns, takes on more of the responsibilities of parenting his three rambunctious children, Kate, Emma, and Teddy. Eddie, Adam must learn to balance the challenge with running his contracting business with his brother, Don, while at the same time dealing with his overbearing father, Joe. So that's the material. It's an original idea. And I, as the producer, have brought on Matt LeBlanc to be the lead, to be Adam. Matt LeBlanc is Joey from Friends. He says, how you doing, if that's helpful. <laughs> so if you're a producer and you're taking this idea and you've got Joey from Friends to star, where, do you, where would you bring the show to? Where do you think you should sell it? That's a good question. The same channel as Friends. That's a great idea, NBC. That was a great, any other ideas? No bad ideas. Where do you think it goes, guys? Based on what Jeremy just taught you. Throw it out. Throw it out. Andrew, what's up? Uh, Netflix, maybe? 
Netflix is a good idea because Netflix makes a lot of different stuff. So we thought NBC, we thought Netflix. This show is a real show. It's called Man with a Plan and actually went to CBS. But it's good to know CBS and NBC fight over a lot of the same shows because they want them both. So that was a really great idea. All right, next question. We have a limited series, so a short-ended series spinoff from a recent Academy Award winning film that also set international box office records. It sounds fancy. You have an, the original filmmaker of the original movie on board to helm it, to direct it, and he's partnering with an additional Academy Award winning screenwriter, and they have Mark Ruffalo, who's Hulk from all the Avengers movies starring. So this seems pretty fancy. Where do you think this goes? Maybe Disney, because Avengers is kind of on Disney like Plus. That's such a good idea. Disney Plus is a great idea. I will say the show is a bit, it's, it's aimed at adults. So that, I should put, I put that in Disney Plus is a really good idea. But if it's aimed for adults, where else are you thinking? HBO. Correct. They're doing a spinoff of the movie Parasite, which won the Oscar this past spring. In the days of you are, we can go outside. And HBO is doing it. That's a really good guess. Nice. All right, one more question, and then we'll open it up to just the floor. Um, a multi-season, big budget, so expensive, adaptation of a beloved children's novel that also became a 2003 feature film or movie. The, adap the adaptation is meant for co-viewing, which means that you're supposed to be for children and adults, and, but there's no major talent, actors, or whatnot attached. Where would you shop this? Maybe Netflix. Netflix is a great idea. Yeah. Disney Plus is a great idea. Where else? Prime Video. Great idea. So this is actually something I'm doing, and I am turning the book holes. Anyone read the book holes? Yeah. I know. You have it's good, right? Yeah. We're doing it. We're doing That's it into. It. We're doing it into a TV show at Disney Plus, and there's no guarantee it will ever be made. Oh. Cool. Um, but it's going to be kind of like. It is a movie, so but we're doing something completely, almost like Stranger Things with it at Disney Plus. Not as scary as Stranger Things, but with a bunch of like, you know, go teenagers energy and uh, a, a really like cool period element in it. So that's that's what we're doing. And I would that, totally watch that. Yeah, totally. and see, producing is not that hard. So for the last five minutes, I just wanted to open it up to everybody and see if you guys had any just random questions. And there's no bad questions. I'll start with one question. One second. Yeah. Hold on, hold on one second, guys. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> what was the question? Well, my question is, so is it always, is, is, is it the usual order that there's material talent, then, then money, then? The money, that's a great yeah. question. Usually yes, but sometimes, the money will come first. So if there's, you know, or I would say for example, for Holes, they want a Disney Plus wants to do a Holes TV show so badly that without talent, they'll, they'll put the money up for the material and then get the talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. What else guys, do you have questions? I also wanted to point out while I'm waiting for your questions that Maddie and Jeremy met at PGT when they were kids, very young when they first started, and grew up together at PGT, did lots of shows together, and now they're out in LA working together on projects, Jeremy as a producer, Maddie as a writer, and they're working together, and I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit about like the friendships you make doing yeah. work together as kids, and then now as yeah. adults, and neither of you necessarily expected to be doing what you're doing like no, Maddie I always thought Maddie was going to be on Broadway no right. it's such a it's such <laughs> so a good question um so you know Matt you guys met Maddie earlier today right so yeah, Maddie, some of them did yeah cool well Maddie and I grew up together uh, at PGT but you know she was two years older than me and we were always friends but when someone what's cool about PGT is that age doesn't always matter so we were always friends from a very young age and did like seven plays or something like that together, which is bananas. Um, and then she moved to LA way before me. But then when I came to LA, we just kind of rekindled our friendship. And we thought like, what are we doing? We should work together. And that's what producing is. Maddie has all these great ideas as a writer. So she brings the material. 
And then we kind of work together to develop the ideas and hopefully sell them, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. So just always cultivating those creative connections and those friendships. That's so much a part of yeah. it. Such a joyful part of your work, I think. Yeah. And, and I then think they that's what's little cool pictures about. of themselves working together. <laughs> we do. But what's cool about PGT is that like, you know, it's not just for a summer. You make so many friends, even virtually, who last into your late 20s. <laughs> 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 um, any other questions? Oh, um, I see chats. Was that at me? Uh, oh, no, you I watch can't. Riverdale. Thanks, Isabel. And Emma Watson <laughs> is talent. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> I um, also wonder if you could speak a little bit about how you've seen the industry just during this time, um, just because this is like a little bit our future for now for the time being of like how, yeah. I mean, I know you moved out to LA just before all this started, um, but how, I mean, the industry is continuing, right? So like how have things shifted and how is yeah. it sort of persevering in this moment and what that's been like? Yeah, well, hopefully with good spirits, a lot of people are doing way more animated shows because you can do all of those, you know, you can write those together on Zoom and then you can go off and draw in your private apartment or house. Um, and then, you know, as of last month in other parts of the world where it's, we're doing a little better, production has started again. So in Vancouver, they're shooting again and in New Zealand and Australia. And just as of today, production can start in New York again, as long as everyone's taking the right precautions, which is really exciting. So the reality is TV is going to continue to do pretty well. Um, movies are going to be tough because before, unless movie theaters can open, it's going to be, continue to be hard to release movies. I don't know if you guys have heard about the movie Mulan. Um, it's amazing. I've seen it. It was supposed to debut in mid-March. It just keeps moving and moving. And they can't, they can't release that in theaters until everybody feels safe enough to go to the theaters because everyone's safety is the most important thing. You know, we're not lifesavers. We're just making movies and TV shows. <laughs> um, so it's tough. It's tough. Um, I have friends who are writers on the show Mixed Dish. I don't know if you guys have seen that show on ABC, but they're starting to talk about production and they're just doing no crowd scenes and they're keeping everybody six feet apart. And <laughs> if they do shows at school, they're always only going to be, you know, school nurse scenes or meetings with the principal. <laughs> They're not going to be class. <laughs> um, but hopefully Crazy. sooner rather than later, we can all move past this and, and get back to a place where we feel safe to shoot. And that would be amazing because we love what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions from you guys before I ask my questions? <laughs> <laughs> I can ask you. you. My questions any time. <laughs> I have a question. I yes. just want to know. How did you learn about producing? Because I feel like it's not something that's really talked about. So when you figured out that this was something you wanted to do, how did you figure out how to get started? That's a great question. So um, honestly, I think PGT was a big part of that because I, I, I was an actor like, you know, you guys. And I always liked it, but it was something that I knew I didn't necessarily want to pursue in life. I just had a great time with all my friends. So I kept doing it. But I was always really curious what Jill and Steven were doing when we weren't there. and would often like annoyingly ask Steven questions like at the lighting booth and stuff. And I like that's all the, those were all the things that really interested me. And I didn't realize that that was that could be turned into a career. I just thought I was annoying. <laughs> 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 and um, but then, you know, I just started reading and, and watching TV and seeing like, there are all these names showing up on the bottom of the screen before, like, who are these people? Are they getting paid? <laughs> that sounds nice. And I just kept asking a lot of questions. And I, you know, I went to college and I majored in English and political science, which doesn't get you necessarily any career, but they're cool things to study. Um, and then when you're in college, what you can do is start interning, which is where you work for a summer, a few days a week in college, you just you shadow people and you get people coffee and make photocopies, but you learn and you just watch people do the jobs. And I did a bunch of crazy internships, but I interned at NBC the summer before my senior year of college at the 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Rockefeller Center in Man Manhattan. And I was like, oh, this. So it just took a lot of like trial by error to kind of figure out what it was. Um, and it was, and that's kind of how I did it. And by the way, like I started in movies. TV is actually kind of new to me. Um, so I'm still learning every day. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? 
Jeremy, I'd love to know what you know now about the industry you're working in that you wouldn't have known when you were 15, obviously, or 10 or whatever, when you were being an actor on a stage, but you know now that's like so surprising to you or like your big takeaway that's like, yeah, God, I would, wish I would have known or whatever that you, you know. Yeah, well, there are a few things. Um, I'll, I'll give my, my two favorites. The first is that, you know, when I was growing up, I was like so intimidated or excited by movie stars or TV stars. And now that I know many of them and have friends who do that job, like my best friends, you know, famous actor, like they're all just humans. They're just human beings. Like they may have a lot of Instagram followers, but they're truly like human beings who have anxiety and have happiness and like all those things. So I, you know, I meet a lot of cool people and I'm excited to meet them because I love talking about art and TV, but I, I'm never like, oh my God, give me your autograph because I'm, I just recognize them as human beings. And then the second is that every person, every viewer has taste and no one can take that away from you. And there's nothing wrong with your taste. The TV shows and movies and books and music that you like is important. And so when I am looking for things to produce, I mean, I have to look for material talent and get the money. But my first question is, do I like it? Does it suit my taste? And maybe other people don't agree with that taste, but I believe, I have to believe that if I think something's cool, hopefully other people will too. And that's something I didn't know growing up. Cause like, I was like, you know, I ran track a little bit and like was a huge nerd, but also like I loved musical theater and like none of my friends in school like musical theater. And I thought for a little bit, that was kind of weird. And now I'm like, no, that is so cool. And there are just other people and they may just not be in your group of friends or in your you know high school math class. Um, but the world is big and your taste is probably shared by lots of people, even if you don't know it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You guys, let's say a big giant thank you to Jeremy. It is so, so great to have you back home at BGT. Yeah. Even if it's 